Hey guys, just going to cover off a music video. So we're going to create a brand new project and go through and let's have a look at what we're going to be working with. So let's have a look. Hopefully I've transferred all the files. Let's just do this. So um, first things first, working on a M2 drive. So this is a, M a Samsung M2 or M.2 SSD drive. They seem to be the quickest, certainly a lot faster. Get the 32 gigabyte of those. So once again, just to speed up the whole process, um, you've got to do a lot better there. Now we've got a couple of interesting pieces of footage to work with. One of them, <clears throat> we went out and found a really cool place that actually takes this old um, footage and this was shot on video 8 or super video 8 I think it was uh, back in the 90s so early 90s we had the 4.3 I believe um, type of video so he gave me the cassettes and I took them to a place that was brilliant in Melbourne called CNET I believe over in Bandura <clears throat> and um, I'll probably leave a link in the description but this is fantastic footage and it certainly has taught me a lot about um, you know what footage used to look like you can see for example when you get told I think about chromatic aberration you can see how the reds for example you know the hat is right there in terms of its edge but you can see the red has just bled out um, the greens and the blues, all these colors are bleeding out of their, um, you know, and it's fantastic. This is, this is beautiful footage um, that we're going to be using in the music video. So we got that transcoded and essentially what they do is they play the videos in real time and they <clears throat> record them to DVD, burn it to DVD and then they can um, turn it into an mp4 so it's fantastic that's one of the clips that we're going to be working with <clears throat> and the other one was this one here now we've got about looks like an hour and a half of tape so this was fully filmed and you can see all the grain in it as well <clears throat> so there's a lot of grain and all kinds of color distortion happening in the noise where say a white wall for example is made up of blue green and red all just splayed everywhere so clearly the rgb um, of the sensor isn't able to really reproduce this noisy low light environment but that's great i mean that was the whole charm of this type of <laughs> this is just great stuff isn't it you know Really fantastic video. You know, you get modern day actors to try to do this. They can't do it. And it's naturally captured on a video 8 <clears throat> camera. So this is adorable. I mean, I could go through this quite slowly. Um, but we'll certainly be bringing that into the uh, project. There's some beautiful stuff here. All wonderful. All perfect. Um, <clears throat> so these are his kids. His son his daughter, um, I'm not sure if he has two sons, to be honest, I thought he only had one, there might be a cousin in here, and that's his youngest daughter, so beautiful stuff, love it, absolutely wonderful, <clears throat> so we'll be using that footage, so just so you know, um, that type of thing, you got to do your, your hunting around, some companies will do it for $35 a tape, I found a place, CNET, in, um, Bandura, Melbourne, <clears throat> $15 a tape. Brilliant. And they did it overnight, which was incredible. The rest of this was shot on a Canon 5D. At the time we shot this, um, we shot it straight to compact flash card. These days we're doing a workflow, which isn't too bad, but these days we're doing a workflow where we shoot the Canon 5D footage straight to an Atomos recorder and then bringing that into um, the timeline of Adobe Premiere and 
Um, you know, it's much, much higher quality. It's DNX HD 220. So it's 422, I believe 10 bit, don't quote me, but certainly very nice. Don't get me wrong. There is something very beautiful about the Canon camera anyway. We're going to do a couple of tests where we do a recording um, in RAW straight to the compact flash card. And if we find that that works really well also, and we're getting really pleasing results and good color from it, then we'll probably stay doing that. So put simply, we use Magic Lantern on the um, Canon 5D. And what we do with the Canon 5D is um, with Magic Lantern, we've got a couple of options, but one of them is that we can record straight raw footage, which technically means that we're capturing more of the real image as opposed to it having um, the, put simply, H.264 is a smaller file size. The downside, it, it's lost a lot of color information and, and possibly a few other things. The other thing I'm gonna be trying and I haven't bought it yet, but it looks like I'll be grabbing it, is um, uh, there is this product here, which hopefully loads up in a sec. But uh, let's look at a few of these videos just to give us an idea of what we have. Um, we've got the Canon 5D Mac 2 custom picture profiles from um, Hurlbut's or the Hurl blog. But put simply... We'll give that a go. I'll probably do a video on that, but we'll try a picture profile that essentially should increase the dynamic range of the camera. So that means we get probably an extra stop or two in the in the shade um, or the shadow detail, and a little bit more in the um, in the highlights. Not that we need a lot. Like I said, the Canon 5D, quite an incredible camera. Now the only thing with the Magic Bullet sorry, the Magic Lantern, is that I think actually with a big compact flash card, like a 128 gig compact flash card, and then shoot in RAW, and I think your Canon 5D Mac 2 still is a very powerful camera. Um, with the Magic Lantern, the RAW, shooting in RAW, and then shooting straight to a large, fast compact flash card, you want to get the fastest you can get. Um, probably B and H is the best place to go because otherwise the prices, unfortunately, in Australia are exorbitant. They can cost hundreds of dollars for what should be about 80 bucks. Having said that, this was shot um, on a 50 mil lens. Um, personally, we could have gone 70 mil and would have got much more softer in the background, and but we would have distorted things a bit. That's the only drama with, and obviously we didn't have much room to keep moving the camera further and further back. This was all also shot on a Miller tripod. So the Miller tripod, we're using the Miller Air. Those things are incredible. They are butter smooth. That, that Miller tripod, I'll probably do a review on that as well. A couple of things I want to review, but they are amazing. Look how smooth the shots are. Much, much better than any Manfrotto tripod that I've tried using. I couldn't possibly get this type of smoothness from a, um, from a, uh, what's it called? From a Manfrotto. So the Miller are amazing. They, they're just super smooth. I think the Miller Air technology was superseding the older Miller tripod. So the older ones are not as good as the new Miller Air. I think what they did was an accident. I think Miller tried to make a, a, I guess, a cut down version of their tripod uh, for DSLRs, thinking that they made them lighter, they would be better for DSLRs. What they inevitably found was that the Miller tripod air system is infinitely better and uh, amazing. So I'm just giving an idea of how the project came about. Um, we shot, you know, what we shot on and what we're gonna to try to piece together. And of course, we just you know did some close-up work. Now I tried to get um, very steady and stable on a Manfrotto fig rig. So the Manfrotto fig rig, in my opinion, is amazing. It's beautiful. It's got a bit of a handheld feel to it. Um, the only thing we wanna do with our, our fig rig 
um, is eventually introduced. Now, unfortunately, they don't sell them anymore, which I'm assuming is going to change at some point because that is insane if they don't sell the fig rig. The fig rig, there were idiots online complaining that it was too expensive. Um, I think that's ludicrous. They were $300, three to $400. But people were saying they could build something for 25 bucks with PVC pipe. And I'm like, well, good luck showing your clients PVC pipe when you rock up, they're going to laugh at you. So, well, come on, who's going to take you seriously when you rock up with PVC pipe and put it together in front of people and paint it black? I mean, it was ridiculous. Um, having said that, the newer, the latest Miller um, fig rig had the rail system built into it and it looked amazing. I'll do a review on that as well. I'm going to probably review most of the, the gear that's in this. But essentially, the fig rig allows you to mount your camera um, onto it on the rails and then you have a shoulder mount on the back of that you want to clamp something so it sits on your shoulder and you've got none of the tilt happening so the fig rig now is just just taking your beautiful soft movement which I think looks amazing there's no need for this super steady glide cam stuff I think the look and feel of a fig rig feels right it has a um, a psychological feel to it that I think works beautiful. Whereas a, a steady cam, I believe, calls a lot of attention to itself. The glide cam, every time I see glide cam footage, I feel like I'm being pulled out of whatever it is I'm watching. I don't feel like I'm being pulled in, I feel like I'm being pulled out. So it's kind of interesting, it draws, it's too smooth and, and it's unnatural. We don't experience that in our real world. Um, we, what we experience in our real world is that slight little bump and whatever else because that's the reality. This is interesting footage as well. Seeing someone get up, we'll see if we're able to use some of this as well. So, you know, someone just getting up. Do you, do you ever get good footage out of that? You never know. It depends what the person does. Um, but I think we did well here. We're going to review this footage, obviously, uh, when we get it into the timeline. So let's get started. I know I, I went on a bit there, but I wanted to give you an idea of well, what are we dealing with. We're dealing with two types of clip, five, Canon 5D, and of course we're dealing with the, um, what's it called? The, um, the old Video 8 footage. And the idea was that we're going to maybe superimpose the old footage on top of the new footage and kind of get a blended look between the two and hopefully we find a cool way to do that. But right now, we're gonna start a new project. First thing I like to do is go to a location. So we're gonna browse onto the fast drive, current project in the mystery music video. So I've just named my file after the song that we're doing the music video for. I think that makes sense. So let's do that. We've selected the folder don't call it untitled. We're going to call this the mystery uh, music video. Now, Mercury playback engine is because I have a NVIDIA card. Later on, if I upgrade to um, an AMD type uh, system with eight cores, because I'm tempted to get a AMD 1700X and then get the best graphic card that suits it. Um, the new AMD... Um, I think it was the thread rippers are out, which are 12 core, and there's another one that's 16 core. I think that's pretty incredible, especially for videographers. In terms of scratch discs, I haven't seen a reason to jump around too much. Um, I'd be look. I guess the only thing you could do is try having a scratch disc um, that's separate to. But when you're on SSD drives, I don't think scratch disks make sense. If you know what I mean, because if you're if you're on an M.2 SSD drive, that's super quick anyway. With you know, pretty much, um, it's as quick as it's going to be. Does then having another SSD drive for all this other stuff make things quicker? I haven't noticed a difference. I could personally go in and have two SSD drives and have the project file sitting on one. Um, the software sitting on another, all this other stuff, but I'm not sure SSD drives benefit from that because they're so quick anyway. So let's just keep it in the same for now. And we've created the project. <clears throat> now, the easiest thing I can do is very simply, we're going to add a couple of bins. Let's do them all together. 
Now, let's have a look. We're going to do um, Canon, okay, 5D video. It's going to be the first one, right? Now, we can color code that. Um, we add a label, and we can make it purple. Now, just in case you're wondering where your colors are coming from and the, and the names, just go to, I believe it's Edit Preferences, and go into label colors and you can rename your label colors to names like I can't stand things like cyan and magenta I always get confused so I just can't be bothered I think there's stupid technical words uh, for what I never understood like magenta in my opinion is pink right I think cyan typically is light blue in my mind um, you know you know that sort of thing so that's what I've done purple blue yellow, pink, just name it. And of course you can double click and pick your color and you're done. So I've gone for these colors and you can obviously pick what you like. Red's an interesting one. If you're not really happy with that red, you can change it, but just pick what colors you want. And I've renamed everything. So we're done. Now we're going to do the next, uh, did that accidentally? Yep. Go in there. So I think I can move that out. Now, I can't be bothered with that, so I might just get rid of it just for now. I'm trying to move it out of there and whatever else. i just clear it. I can't be bothered. Easiest way to get rid of a bin that's not in the right spot um, is you meant to just drag it up and around. But let's just uh, unclick there. So we want to create a new bin and obviously have it sitting underneath. Then we've got the Super 8 um, video. Now don't quote me if it was called Super 8. I don't think it was called Super 8, but it was called, I think it was called Video 8 or something like that, but we get it. It's the old video and we'll uh, label that. Let's make it blue. So we're just clicking so that we don't create another subfolder because we, what we want now is, um, we don't really have audio for this because it's just one simple song for the audio. So the only other thing I can think of is maybe we'll create the sequence. Okay, if we do multiple sequence, um, but basically sequence is if we create multiple sequences and all that stuff. But essentially, uh, we'll label that and we can go with light blue. Now, easiest way to bring footage in and not have to, you could do something like this. You could just go, you know, drag folders and all this other rubbish. The problem is it starts putting them everywhere. What I want to do is get all the Canon 5D footage straight into the right bin, yeah? Which is that little folder here. Bin or folder, same thing. It's essentially a location. So we're going to go import. We're going to go here, current project, mystery, and double click and grab the lot. <clears throat> I'm not worried about, you know, what's in, what's out. Now, in case you're wondering how these got titled, it was done with Prelude. I have done videos on Prelude in the past. And the one thing about Prelude, Adobe Prelude, that makes it useful is that it allows you to look at all of your footage in whatever codec it is. And essentially, the main thing is rename the files. So that way, um, you don't end up with, you know, IMG underscore you know, whatever, right? You can actually say, you know, this is um, blah, blah, right? You name the video. And in my case, I've just gone Canon 5D, Steve Mystery Bar. I could have done something better. Like I could have gone, you know, Steve singing and then close-ups and all this other stuff. I probably should have done that. That would have been nicer. Um, but in any case... In, with Prelude, you're bringing in a whole bunch of files. You get to review. If you see something's not needed, you don't bring it in. And so essentially, Prelude is used to grab things off of SD cards, off of your compact flash cards. In this case, it was compact flash. We will be doing more experiments, like I said, but that's what it's designed for. That's what Prelude's good for. And then renaming and putting them into your hard drives where you want. So it's taking something off a compact flash card or SSD drive or whatever, and bringing it across to your project folder. That's what Prelude does. And of course, if you have a look, it's all in the right spot. Okay, so that's what we wanted there. Okay. Now, if we double click the first one, 
we can see what we have. What I'm gonna show you is a workflow of, oh, and I can just recolor that. I think that's a bit of a bug, by the way, this little thing, because once you click to there, it disappears, but yeah, it seems to feed through. Label and purple, so we've got all of that happening there. Yeah, like I said, you just click and it seems to disappear. I think that's actually a glitch. Now, in here, the Super 8 video, this is easy, right? Import, and then we're gonna grab, we're gonna go one level up, grab one, shift click, two, and open. And they're all in the right spot. Well, yep, they're color coded correctly, which is great. Now, once again, this is a classic example of not a very useful title name, 1.mp4, and then the next one is 2.mp4. Now that's fine, the guys at CNET, you know, they just did what they did. Um, but you can see that that's not really useful. Imagine if you had 50 of these, and you've just got one to 50, with no description of what each video is, now you don't know what the video is, and that's what Prelude's for. Prelude's good at, you know, you could grab the first five, and go, okay, these are kids playing in the park. Right, so you go one, underscore, kids playing in park, underscore, and then the date, and you're done. And now you know these five videos are kids playing. These five videos are, you know, children in class. These five videos are, you know, parents and blah, blah, dancing. So you now know what each video is just by looking at it, okay? Just because of the title, as opposed to having to click everything. So in future, I'd probably do a bit better of a job here um, as you can see, I'm looking at this going, what's what, right? Okay, so that's done. The only other thing to bring in now is the song itself. And I hope it's one of the first things you want to do when you're working with a client and a music video is get the song. And unfortunately, I don't have the song here, so I'm going to have to look for it now, which I'm hoping is here. It would be very helpful if it was. So the best thing I can do is leave the song there, go right click and go um, copy, because we just want to leave that there for now. Go double click in here, double click in there, go into the thing, right click and paste it. Um, and you're done, right? Now what we can do is just go into here. Now don't select any of the folders and just go file, import, and the mystery song and bang. And as you can see, it should be where it is, right? And we've color coded it green, that's fine, that's not a problem. So there's your song. Now what we're gonna do, you've got an option here, and depending on who you talk to, you've got an option of how you actually create a video. You've got one school of thought is that you go like this. You go um, file, new, sequence, and you ignore the video codec and all that stuff and having spoken to a guy that had been um, what he would do is create DVDs and DVD authoring and all that stuff and, and his job was to create um, copies of DVDs of people's projects and if you talk to someone like that and ask what file format do you want what what um, what output should I give you when I send you this video that you're gonna turn into a DVD and all this other stuff. And he'll tell you to give him AVC, so let's just find where this is. For Windows, he would go AVC Intra, um, 1080p, and go that. Now, that's for 1080p full HD uh, with the, um, you know, full HD. If you've gone and done Ultra HD or something more, um, then we've got two options. I'm looking at all these other formats and thinking they're probably not appropriate, or I could be wrong. Um, I don't think you'd be doing this, even though technically I have a DNX HD um, set of videos. Please don't quote me. Um, but I suspect that this is what we're going to see in the future. D and X HR. So in other words, if you're working in a much higher um, quality project, don't be surprised if this is going to be the output. So depending on who you talk to, if you're talking to someone that does DVD authoring for older 
um, you know, and it was around in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, you're going to hear AVC intra. But if you're talking to someone in this day, um, they'll probably turn around and go, no, I don't want that. I want D and X, and they're going to want HD, or um, if that's full HD, 1080p, so 1920 by 1080, or they're going to want D and X HR, high resolution, clearly, and you've got up to 4K here. Now, in case you're wondering what's the difference between 4K and Ultra HD, there's a slight difference. Don't quote me the exact numbers, but I think Ultra HD is sitting about 3.1 something. So put simply, 2K is slightly larger than HD. Um, I know I'm not giving you the best explanation here, but you know you can just quickly Google the frame sizes of um, 2K. But put simply, 2K is just a little bit bigger than HD. 4K is the full the full 4,000 pixel by, it's, it's 4,100 and something by, you know. And then Ultra HD is 3,000. So you've got 4K is the largest, then it's Ultra HD, then it's 2K. Now, do you have to shoot in Ultra HD, for example, to then have an Ultra HD project. Well, believe it or not, you don't. You could technically shoot in 4K or 2K or even 1080, but I would suggest using Red Giant's trap code um, 4K upscaler. So Red Giant make some really good pro products. Um, let me see if I can find one of their... So Red Giant um, have trap code and it's here. No, it's not the trap code. It's the shooter suite, sorry, an instant 4K, which I'll probably end up buying. Um, this will actually allow you to up convert video to 4K. So what I would do with my 5D footage, if I shot it on, let's say, an Atomos, problem with the Atomos is it adds black bars on the left and the right. It's not the fault of Atomos. It's unfortunate, but it's the problem that you get with... Um, Canon's earlier Mac 2 camera not being designed for um, the Atomos. In any case, what I would do is take the uh, video and upscale it to 2K. And then, obviously, now the video is upscaled. Now, the advantage of um, um, Red Giant is that it's actually giving you proper and more powerful upscaling and pure and simply they use an algorithm to make sure that you're not getting noisy or you know lossy issues you know color issues and things like that so put simply you basically are scaling the video to be bigger without all the issues so that means you could technically shoot in hd and then upscale it to 2K and all the rest of it. So the reason I raise this is sometimes you're shooting with a camera that quite frankly doesn't have 4K capability, but, or natively, right? But that doesn't mean you can't take a HD image and turn it into 4K. And as you can see, the 4K image is much, much bigger than, than HD. And Ultra HD would sit in here somewhere. Um, and then 2K sits about here, right? So that's the good thing. So I would take my Canon 5D with its black bars, upscale it to 2K, drop it into the timeline and find that, yes, some of it's cropped, but the image is increased um, and it looks amazing. So that's what I would do here is definitely get the, um, this, this is definitely worth buying. Uh, Pluralize is brilliant for syncing sound, um, instant 4K and frames is great for um, dealing with deinterlaced footage. So if someone ever gives you um, video that's interlaced and you want to get rid of that um, um, and make it um, uh, so that you don't get this little glitching going on um, when when you see the fo footage, by all means, get that. All right, so that's covered that off. Now, in this case, we're going to go with this workflow. Having said that, I'm going to do my research and decide possibly going forward that I'm going to be dealing with DNX HD and pick my 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 thing here it is DNX high quality 1080p um, which the the way it works is that it's generally a 10-bit color space 
422. Um, and then essentially that's the, you know, that's the best. That's going to give you the very high quality, um, full color. You can see the, the quality on, on an Atomos when you record straight to an Atomos on an SSD drive. The, the quality of the color and everything is fantastic. So that's what you'd probably start doing in the future. So put simply, I think the other difference is that you're getting um, much better quality from using this. But this you'd only use if you've been recording to, to an external recorder like the Atomos, the Ninja Flame, and things like that. Otherwise, don't bother, right? So we didn't do that with this. So then this would not be appropriate for this project. That's why we're going to go with that. And we're just going to go, oh, well, let's give it a decent name here. This is going to be the um, mystery. I usually do things like hyphens. Um, you might even go this. You might even go S-E-Q space hyphen and then go mystery, right? And then go hyphen final. Now, sometimes I'll create a different... Um, sequence what i call a holding sequence or a sequence that's preparing for something else but in this case we've got the sound um, that we're going to be using which is the song so let's just drag that in okay and we immediately know that we're dealing with a timeline of about five minutes uh, just so you know where that's coming from it's uh it's coming from here and then we've got work area bar. So in case you want that in there, I like the work area bar now, I've got used to it. So basically what it does is it's good for when you need to quickly um, do sequence, render entire work area. And of course you can just render little sections to see what where you're at. Um, shortcut for seeing the sequence, of course, you press the, the tilde key, which is the key next to the number one and above the tab. So it's the tilde key. It's the one on the left side of the number one. So I press that and of course it goes into full screen. We're not going to need these anymore. In fact, we're not even going to need any more audio and sound because we've basically got the song right there. Let's just listen to it a little bit. I'll give you uh, a bit of what's going on in the song. So what I'll do now is we're going to basically start watching the footage. Uh, I might play a bit more of the song and then I was hoping I could actually watch some of the footage while the song played, but it doesn't look like it's going to let me. Now, the other thing I need to see, let's have a look. Okay, so we're going to get more of this as we go through, but <clears throat> what's probably the most useful thing I can start to do now 
is looking for sections that we think are good and sections that we're not too sure about. So we'll start with the press the home key and we'll just start playing. I'm just looking for a smooth pan up. Let's see if we got a smooth pan or are we setting up? So sometimes you do the wrong thing. And here's a tip for anyone doing any video work. Don't start recording um, while you're setting up. Um, so in other words, start recording when you're actually needing to. So you don't get into this silly habit of pressing record and then find you're adjusting your tripod and doing all this stuff and then just record what is essentially completely useless. Um, you know, you know, these little movements of the camera going around, you clearly know you're not recording. So we get to about here and I think this is where we can mark by pressing the M key. Now the reason I put down markers is because you can jump to them very quickly. Now, like I've, I've mentioned this thing before, but the Tartarus, uh, I've always got been confused of the title of this thing, but essentially, I use a um, a Tartarus, which is made by Razor, and uh, that's where I've built all my short shortcuts into. So I can jump to a um, marker with the press of a button, and of course I mark everything. So I like to watch footage. This is, of course, like I said early in the video, recorded with a Canon 5D and also using the Miller tripod, the Miller Air system is incredible um from the basic six kilo payload version of the miller right up until um now little things that we can start sort of making a note of let's have a look we could put in here stopped panning so let's do it go m m so we do double m and we go camera pan just learn to spell here and get the right keys on the keyboard tab and then go camera stopped panning okay and you can do colors here you can put little you know colors like yellow um, you know white you know, if you want to say that white means that it's a note about the camera move, green tends to suggest this is the beginning of the clip. Um, in fact, you could even pretty much plan your whole shoot. Um, you know, I could even go back to this marker. So as I say, I jump to it. I think to get to your markers, um, I can mention some of them. I've got a, a shortcut. Um and I'm assuming I'm going to find it pretty quickly. General shortcuts. Let's see if I can just find it for you guys. Um, to jump to a marker. Um, previous marker is Control Shift M. Next marker is Shift M. So if I go, put simply, if I press play. So if I go Control Shift M, you jump straight to there. Now to to get these, um, this is obviously what I'm working off. It's it's that. Uh, this was brought on Shortcuts, um, uh, Shortcut World or Shortcut Land. I probably should put the uh, link in the des um, the description as well. But you're going to want to know your shortcuts between your markers. So Control Shift M goes to the previous marker. Shift M goes to the next marker. So if I go Shift M. Um, I jump to the next marker, control shift M, go back. Or I've got it on my, my little Tartarus um, razor. And of course, that's actually the shortcut built into these things. They're brilliant. Um, they work incredibly well. And I would hate to video edit without it. Um, now, what we do is we've made a note here. So we can just hover over it. Camera pan, camera stopped panning. So we're going to jump to that. So I press the number four just on its own on my um, keyboard here, the little Tartarus, and I, I'm immediately jumping to it. Now what I can do is okay. So right here, 
Now, I believe he was talking to his little dog there, but I like the breath, so we might use that. Um, I could make a note of that as well. Now, another one I could do is just making note of what he's actually singing. So if we turn me down and turn this up, So one thing I'll note now, because we've been on a few shoots together, I've got to say that our footage is now getting a lot smoother. So we're getting a lot less, because when we used to go on shoots, we used to get a lot of shaky footage. We'd just get all this shaky rubbish and you'd just look at it and go, how can you possibly use this? It looked like it was an earthquake. Whereas now we're actually getting a lot more footage now where it's just all smooth and like this whole clip is almost usable like i'm just looking at it going there's never a moment in here at the moment that we go oh that's that's so what i would normally be telling you right now is i'd mark a marker with red to say this footage is not 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 usable um we'll, we'll get to a point where we see it but essentially i'd mark it red to say this is no good now we haven't had that so far so I guess this is a sign of experience. Um, as we've gotten onto more and more shoots, we've, we've, we've you know used our brains a little bit and said, listen, keep that camera steady. So when you're starting out, you'll find that a lot of your footage, it's always a good idea to go out and do a shoot because you'll find a lot of your footage is shaky. Um, you've moved the camera, you've panned it. You've done way too much movement, more than you thought you realized. We've realized that just a subtle move is infinitely better than just whipping around like an idiot and going, what are we doing? We're moving too quick. So we haven't had that issue. I'm waiting for when we do a proper pan. I'm looking for any time that we might have done a bit of panning. So what we've done on this shoot, just to cover off what we're doing, I'm showing you that this is what I'd call a master clip. This is where we essentially say, this is our safest shot. This is the one where we don't do a lot of movement. Um, we do very little movement. And essentially, um, let's just get him sing the song from start to finish. Any panning that we do, we do like this. Very subtle, very safe. The camera moves very slowly over a protracted period of about 30 to 40 seconds. So it moves a very slow speed. And if you talk to any experienced camera operators and videographers, they will absolutely tell you that glass smooth is all about slow. In other words, they even talk in terms of how much does the camera move over a period of time and they want to move like that. They want to be doing very, very slow and even slower than that. So if you've ever wondered how those big directors get these super smooth shots, it's because they don't do a lot. So sadly, I didn't, I probably should have marked it earlier. Let me just see if I can just, yeah, we've got the point where we start. So let's just do that. Mark it again. And we're going to go start of pan down that's enough we can uh, add that um, and then go won't put you through that let's just uh, quickly get to where it ended but that's the point I'm making um, and I'll just see if we did we pan a little bit earlier so like I said I don't like doing silly camera reframes like You'll see a camera operator and what they'll do is they'll realize, oh, I'm not framed the way I want. 
So they'll just do this. They'll just move the camera and they'll just keep doing it. And then it's, and it's like, and then they move it somewhere and you go, what did you do that for? You just recorded a clean take that was put simply, it was a clean take up until you just decided to do that. And they pointless, right? So there's no need for that. There's never a time where you decide on a shot like this to do any of that. Um, pointless. So it just becomes a pain because now an editor would have to mark there and there and go, oh, camera moves randomly, useless, blah. And next thing you know, you've pretty much ruined a good take. So we're going to get to a point where we've just, you know, it's not even a pan down. It's actually pan sideways. So let's just go there. Even the direction of your pan is a is a, a creative decision, you know. It's do we move and then we stopped. So we'll go M, M, and then uh, stopped pan, um, and that's fine. Now we just continue. Now, if we suspect we're getting pans, what we do is we just go, this is the beginning of it. So we'll just find the start of it. Okay, we're getting a pan. So we go marker. We don't know what side we're going, but it looks like we're going panning uh, right. <clears throat> now, once again, this is one of those edits that most of them are like this anyway, but it's really important that we do an edit where case okay, decided to stop. So that's mark, and we know that that was a pan. Let's just go marker again. Go stopped, pan, uh, right. Okay, press enter. So the enter means that we've just done that. Uh, and if we hover over it, there's your marker. Go back to the previous marker, right on top of it, and go start of pan, right. Press enter. Now, once again, I could change the color, but let's do that. Jump to the next one. Now, remember, you can't really jump to markers. I think you can double click on them. That's also another option. If you want to just double click on a marker, you can do that. So we're getting another pan. Boom. Let's mark it. And this is one of the things about the Miller Air. It doesn't have that little jarring start. So a lot of the cheaper tripods, and I'm, I'm not sure about the, the Manfrotto's now, but I found that there was just that little shudder, that little shudder that just doesn't work. And it, it you know, it's almost like it wants to, it's that little st sticking and then you just, you get this judder and the camera does that move and then it starts. The Miller doesn't have that. The Miller Air just literally starts to pan perfectly and smoothly and it's flawless. Literally, could you could use that start. Now, it's amazing um, how, how incredible that camera is. This is the end of the song. And we can just mark there to say, hey, that's the end. Okay, so that's the first clip. And you do that for everything. You literally go through and... So I look for things like this. Now, unfortunately, um, we were starting to have some issues with the Atomos, I think, from memory. And uh, 
Right now, the way we would shoot, like I said, with the Canon 5D, is we'd have it so that the Animos is on top of it. We'd, you know, feed. Sadly, though, and foolishly, the Canon 5D Mac II had a HDMI out that was 50p interlaced. And then what the Atomos would do is pull that down to uh, 29.97 or whatever it is. Um, but still, it's interlaced. And then what you do is you use Red Giant's um, frames, which deinterlaces it and turns it into progressive so we'll experiment with that. We'll see if that works well. Um, but technically speaking, you're probably better off using a Canon 5D Mac 3 or 4, which will allow you to send a clean HDMI signal straight to the Atomos with none of the pull down issues. It's a, it's, a, it's a proper progressive output. I still think the 5D camera is excellent to use. Um, there is something good about it. There is something really nice. Uh, option two, we'll probably just use Magic Lantern and see if we can get a good raw image straight onto the, um, what's it called, onto the um, card. The other option we've got is we use the Atomos to kind of get focus. And, and this is the thing about the Atomos, it allows you to pull, pull crazy shots like this um where you are kind of just doing this let's have a look because there's a moment right this is where he's talking to his little dog jimmy <laughs> he loves his little dog jimmy so let's have a look we're obviously guessing where our focal point is So we mark. What I'm looking for Okay, let's have a look. Now, I've also programmed like I use Razer brand of keyboards, the Tartarus mouse is a Razer brand. Um, it's the Razer brand. This my, my mouse is the Razer Death Adder. The keyboard, I think, don't quote me, but it's um, one of their gaming keyboards. But why do I use Razer? Because they've got incredible software that allows you to program. I'm just going to bring it up now. So this is what I'm using. I'm using their Razer Tartarus Chroma. Uh, the Razer Death Adder... 3.6 mouse and the Razer Black Widow keyboard. But what's really cool about this is it allows you to program each key. Uh, and this isn't showing all of the um, macros that I've built into this. Um, there's actually more. Um, don't know where they are. Uh, I might actually just see what the lighting is doing. Not sure why, but there's more um, stuff that I've actually got in here um, the macros okay we don't need that and we don't need that so anyway I'm not sure where it all is but put simply I've got keyboard um, where I can build macros in which means I could make well let's look at the Tartarus because that's the one that I definitely love you can see here that this is the M key this is jump 50 frames. The jump 50 frames is a shortcut that I've done with this. And um, what happened there was I jumped 50 frames back and that's the shift and backspace and it just jumps 50 frames back. So you'll see me using that a lot in case you're wondering how am I going 50 frames back. But like I said, this is the device here. Well worth it for video editors, no question. I'll turn it off for now. Okay, so we can start about there. Now, just because I've placed a marker here, that doesn't mean that that's obviously where I'm going to cut. But it generally means 
this is kind of like boom he looks up M and then he looks at the camera we don't want that so we might even mark that we might just go boom right go M M red boom and then go Steve looks at camera right and we don't want that so the red tells me oh yeah he's looked straight at camera we won't be using that okay boom so mark it So he's looking at his little dog, Jimmy. So then we go here. So we're looking at a point. I'm just pressing the space bar. Boom. Go back 50 frames or whatever it is. Let's have a look. Okay, we won't use anything after that. So we'll get out of there. Good idea to save this project. So we just do that or control save. Let's just double check again. Okay, so let's have a look. Okay, now what we can do here. So he looks up at camera, so we're just going to find that moment. Now he looks up again. Boom. So we know that that's pretty much the end. And then we can just go double M. Steve. looks at camera okay so we know that that's out so we mark it red we know not to bother with anything going forward but in here we're happy with the whole song boom mark it done control s let's go to the next one Okay, so we know that's the start of the song. Let's have a look. Okay, so we know. Now, clearly I directed Steve to not look at the camera. Um, that's very important. One other thing, just a subtle note. These little movements of the camera, you know, the camera starting to pan smoothly. Um, you know, you can be as subtle as you want with camera pans. You can even just do a slight little pan where it just pans very, very subtly for that split two to three seconds and you count that as panning. Believe it or not, um, that was something that famous directors like Sergio Leon would consider they would do these little slight pans if you watch a fistful of dollars and films like the good the bad and the ugly you'll see him do these little subtle pans just just very subtle and it's almost like it's representing a shift in weight of the person looking at the other person it'd be just this little movement of the camera and you you don't realize but you absolutely perceive it subconsciously when you're watching um so sometimes it's fun to kind of think like that how do i move my camera to have a psychological impact on people um but then not being aware 
you know you don't want to call attention to yourself you want to do it really under the radar very very subtle pan movements even framing i mean um you know going for framing that's you know um you know putting him in a in a position that's you know not necessarily natural sometimes it's interesting to have angles that are 100 percent correct you know you're not exactly 45 degrees where i think we're about 42 or 43 or something like that you're not quite 45 um you're doing things that are unusual but basically we're watching this video and i'm really happy that we haven't done any of those obvious silly mistakes where we're just panning left and right and being you know um terrible it's such a skill when you're working with a camera guy that they keep it smooth and steady and make almost the entire clip perfectly usable um, this is uh, one of the guys that i've been working with jamie he's actually a young kid i'm certain he's going to do well in the business of filmmaking he's only 18 but gee i've barely given him any direction or any assistance or any help and every time i point him on a shoot he gets great footage he doesn't mess around um he's really really good so yeah utterly superb camera work because he was doing a lot of it i was kind of directing um and sort of sitting back and and making sure that we're getting usable footage he's done a pretty good job so technically i think he's superb um at his at his uh, camera work it's so hard to find someone that actually gets what camera is and and how to keep things tight um, he's certainly got it right here. <coughs> so I know I'm putting you through a lot here watching all of this, but I mean, that is fantastic. I mean, there's just nothing wrong with any of this. There's not, yeah, you could, you know, get a bit fussy and talk about, eh, could have done this, could have done that, blah, blah. But realistically, you couldn't tell me that there's a shot in there or something that's completely wrong. There's clearly a camera move that shouldn't be there. Okay, so he looks at camera, which we'll probably stop it there. Okay, so we'll get rid of that. Let's get a bit closer to it. Boom. Really happy with that. Um, that's fantastic. So what we're doing now, like I said, is, okay, so this is an example of what I probably could have avoided in Prelude. So Prelude, you wouldn't have brought that in. You wouldn't have even bothered selecting this clip to bring it in. Obviously, I was being a bit lazy that day. Technically speaking, I can just mark it, label red, and that's the end of that. We're not using that clip. The other option I could do is go boom and go clear. Or hide uh, is another one. So we might as well do that. Let's see if that even works. Hide it. So the clip's gone. If I want to see the clip, I go review hidden and there it is. That's probably the better way to do it. So just go click um, and that's the end of it, right? It's hidden. It's a hidden clip. Just be careful with that. Um, don't go hiding things needlessly. I've hidden that simply because it's out of the project. We're not even going to worry about it. We don't want it. So now we're going to look at the next round of stuff, which is close-ups. And like I said, this is on the Manfrotto uh, fig rig. Um, I might just quickly bring that up on here. Let's just have a look at it. The Manfrotto fig rig, I'll just show you the images of it while we... Um... So it's the... Yeah, and unfortunately discontinued at this point in time. Uh, I think that's nutty because the fig rig is superb considering um, how good they are. These are superb. They had the rails. So they've got this little rail system and... It's superb. I think they're incredible. Um, yeah, you know, for the price. And then some people came in and they did this, thinking this was a genius move. 
I mean, look, it's okay, I guess. I mean, I'd do this if I was 13 years of age, I'll be brutally honest with you. Um, But realistically, gee, if I rocked up to a production with that, I'm telling you right now, that's screaming amateur. Um, People wonder why they're hiring me. You know, all these little, this is terrible. And I think, sadly, it it, it almost killed the fig rig. Here we go, bright red. You know what I mean? And okay, I guess it's cute, um, but horrifying. Um, The earlier fig rig had this system, which is not as good as what they ended up coming up with, which is the... um, Definitely that was better with the rails. That's infinitely better because now you're um, using a rail system on your on your, on your your camera. I uh, no idea what this is. I actually think that's actually a steering wheel. Um, so yeah, so this is the system. Works incredible. I happen to almost feel like I've bought the last one on the planet um, because they are so good. So you can clearly see, you've got to be careful about clamping. No, you don't want to um, damage it. But um, what's brilliant about it is it's it's superb. There's a feel to it. There's a look to it. There's a there's a certain style to it that works really well. So enough of that. You get my point. It's a beautiful device. Um, they're brilliant. Let's just stop this guy talking crap. Um, so that's that. Now we should have been watching this. Let's just see what we've got. Once again, now this is what I'm interested in here. Nothing wrong with any of this. Although there is, he's telling off Jimmy. His little dog. So we've got that little moment. Now, here's something I'd mention. Um, With music video, and if you watch some of the great directors, and I'm a huge fan of Sergio Leone, Sergio Leon is, in my opinion, one of those genius directors. Um, and you see how he starts his films. He starts with a wide, wide angle, like as wide as you can get, as high as you can get. That was kind of his way of starting a film. He'd love to be way up in the mountain with a hugely wide angle lens going, looking down at what is essentially the environment that we're in. So no one's going to say, where are we? when you're looking at a wide angle like that, you know exactly where you are. And you've got this little character somewhere in that little massive landscape. There's this little guy on a horse. And then he'll magically zoom in. He'll literally go from that extreme straight into a close-up of the guy wearing his hat and he's riding in. And, And all of a sudden, you've just got this massive leap And that's kind of what you want to be doing when you're doing these shoots is how do we add a bit of drama in terms of framing the shot? Um, What are we trying to do here? And that's, I think, a big question is how do we tell the people where we are and then, boom, this might be our way of ending the music. So what we do, we'll go back 50 frames. Oh, and incidentally, when I'm doing this, I do it in real time and I don't do it like I'm gaming, okay? Um, I used to game. I never did BC because I think it's a bit full on, but I used to play Xbox and whatnot here and there. And um, this is not what video editing... Video editing is not the old, you know, boop, yep, scrub, mm -hmm, yep, clunk, clunk, you know, boom, yep, mm -hmm, yep, you know, right? That's not video editing. Video editing is when you take your time, press your, and watch everything. Watch when the frame stops zooming. Now you know you've, you're starting to zoom back in again, or sorry, um, focus back in again. Okay. Boom. Boom. Mark it. Now, What I'm looking for in this specific shot is when do we start to fade out? Bang. We start about here. Mark. Now, this could be our fade out of the song, right? That's what we're thinking. So what we're going to do is jump to the previous marker, press M and go fade out. 
close up, right? And then in here, I'll go possible ending to the song. Possible, right? Is it the most dramatic way to end? I don't know. But we're going to mark it and we're going to go OK. All right? Now, we can see here. Fantastic. Now we're zooming back in again. So what we could do here is actually use this as a possible start to the song. Now we kind of fluked it a bit. Boom. It would have been great if he had to keep playing. Which I believe he does. So let's do this. We're going to go back here. Go M and then go fade in. Close up. And then go, what's it called? Um... Possible start to the song. Okay, or the music video, right? So we click white, okay. So now we know if we just hover over here, we've got a fade in close up, possible start to the song, possible end to the song. We've kind of got an anchor. Do we do it? I don't know. We will see. It, it, it could be a good way to start. It may not be. There's so many things we can do with After Effects anyway. A lot of you are probably screaming at me saying, hey, dude, you could do an adjustment layer, do a blur filter, you name it, all of that. There's so many incredible things. Even on, um, I know I mentioned um, Red Giant quite a bit. Let's just see if I can find that Red Giant thing again. Red Giant have what's called um, Universe. And this gives you a whole bunch of um, styles and stuff. And certainly one of them would include um, a, a blur of some kind. So, but like I said, there's, there's clearly a difference between filming the blur and then adding it. But you get my point. Um, you know, if you're going for that very naturalistic um, type of thing, You'd go, you know, you, you'll go what you, what you filmed as blur. But if you wanted to, you really could use, um, you know, you know, something in After Effects and 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 all the all the rest of it. So once again, we're zooming out. We're just waiting for that to come back in, so we can see that we just started filming where we think the peak. This could be the very final scene. Once again, the reason why we love the 5D. Obviously, we shoot... This is 50mm. It's the cheap and nasty 50mm lens that they sell for about $120. It's got the... Um, it's got... The aperture size was 1.8. Now, they also make another um, pricier... Uh, lens, I think it's about 300 and something dollars, and that one has a shutter uh, aperture size of 1.2. So obviously the depth of field on that is even even bigger. Um, but what we can see here is we're just looking for that maximum moment of now to really have knocked this out. We could have gone in a little bit, so we could have gone into the you know, just very 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 slowly moved in to that guitar. Um, very, very slowly. Bang, and I think we're at the end of the song. Okay, so we got a shift on that, which we don't want. Boom. Downstroke there. And we'll talk about When's it good to cut, right? Not that I'm the world's greatest editor, but when's a good time to cut? And when, when do you sort of not cut? And you'll find, ironically, that it's always good to cut on action. Watch some of your favorite movies and shows and watch when the editor cuts. And it's usually on action of some kind. Sometimes there's what we call a downbeat and it's done on purpose to give people, I guess, relief. But you'll be surprised to know that cutting on mid-action is really effective and very powerful. So we've got here, um, we're going to do two things here. We're going to call this nice out 
of focus close up, right? And we're going to leave things green for now. Um, that's not a problem. Now, if we really need, what we can do here, okay, we'll go marker. We're going to make this a white one. M again. And this is fully out of focus. And then this could be like a nice cutaway. Choice. So nice cutaway choice. And uh, let's have a look. Um, fully out of focus. Yeah. All right. Mark it white. And this is just to distinguish that this might be a super useful um, part of the song. Boom. And we, I know the song, obviously. So God knows I love you. So I know that that might be a moment to bring that type of thing in and, 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 and lend it. Are we concerned that, you know, he's a little bit out of focus, but the guitar is? I think that's part of the magic of, of not being too precise. Sometimes I think over precision is kind of entering into filmmaking these days. I think everyone's going the same look. Everyone's copying the same lookup tables. And so we're getting these film clips that look almost identical to each other, right? Huge problem, I think. Um, and all the originality is gone. Everyone's using a Ronin. Everyone's using a Steadicam, okay? And so you get these super smooth glided shots and everything's perfect and prim and proper. And you're sort of like, well, that's what every single other music video is doing right now, that everyone's on the Steadicam or the Ronin or whatever. And it's over stylized. Everyone's doing the three point lighting, whether they're doing backlighting or whatever. And so you've got to stop and think a little bit. No one's telling you to light horribly, but you know, suddenly throw pink um, lipstick on the guy. But you get what I'm saying. It doesn't need to be a definite, absolute follow the leader. And if you ever know, a good example is stand up comedians. When you watch stand up comedians, the ones you end up seeing succeed are the ones that are different. The guys that come out with the same old shtick um, act, right, and they do everything by the book, end up blending in with every other by the book comedian. They, they do things to pander to the audience. So as a videographer, stop and think what you're doing. Like I got the fig rig, Manfrotto fig rig, while everyone's probably buying steady cams, Ronins and gimbals, right? But I've decided, well, why would I want to do that? It's going to make me look like everyone else. Oh, don't get me wrong. I think gimbals and all this stuff's amazing, but it's a little too smooth and it's a little too perfect and it's over stylized, in my opinion. This, believe it or not, is what a fig rig looks like. Now, I think I've accidentally pressed. Um, no, that's okay. It's, that's just amazing on a 5D. So I'm blown away by this. This is really quite incredible how smooth this is looking um, on a Canon 5D. So we moved really, really slow. There was no, no heavy, fast movement. It was all super, super steady. Um, so let's just have a look. I've got to be honest with you, I've, it's been a while since I've been on a shoot where I could look at the footage and honestly say most of it's usable. I, I, anyone that brought me this, if I was the editor, I'd be wrapped. I'm not looking at rubbish. I'm not marking garbage. I'm looking at this stuff going, it's usable. It's totally usable. This whole footage is totally usable. So... Amazing. So we'll go back a sec and just see if we can find that spot before we go back up. So I'll go back. 
50 frames or whatever it is. Let's just have a look. About there, it seems to be. So what I can do now, clearly this is a pan down. So we're going to go bang and go start of pan down. Okay. And then jump to here because we've seen that part of the footage. And we're probably going to pan up. Now this is a technique that I've learned when I was doing a shoot. Um, I realized that it makes perfect sense to do a pan down as smooth as possible. Just get to the end of that pan down. And once you've done that, give yourself another choice. Just pause at the bottom of that. Give yourself a beat, right? Just leave it there steady. So that now gives you that shot to use if you needed to use it. And then start panning up. And so you do now a pan up. What you don't do is go nice smooth pan down, right? And then go, oh, I'll get another pan down. So you go, go whip it up and then start panning down. And then go, oh, you know, I'm a bit bored of this now. I'll, I'll blur, and then do this. Forget all that. Just do a nice clean pan down, get to the bottom. Totally end the pan. Stop, hold, and give yourself 10 seconds of just holding. Because that's now a shot. It's actually usable footage. That point in time is now usable. Then pan up nice and clean. Right? Or if you're a bit bored of the pan up, there's nothing to stop you from now panning along the guitar you have now given yourself very good so what you've done you've panned down held right or panned up slowly got back to the middle of the guitar and once you get to there go climb up the uh the fretboard so that's a fantastic way to shoot all of that footage is usable there's not one point in that in that filming that would be useless right? Probably the one point you wouldn't use is where you actually, you know, you don't, you know, you don't want to probably finish and then do the start, but you can see that most of that is absolutely usable. So that's the point I'm making there. As you can see now we're panning up. We could have paused here and then started panning up the fretboard, right? That's all good. Now, another thing you can start to do um, in this case is what you would do is what's called a fade out with focus, right? So in other words, you're fading out of the shot with the focus. It's a brilliant way to end a shot of a music video, right? So one of the shots is ending with a fade out done and, and, and handled by the focus ring, right? So you're pulling focus and, and then pulling focus to get out of focus. Then your next shot can be the opposite of that. It can actually be from out of focus into focus. So hopefully you realize to shoot like that. So one of the easy ways to get those kinds of shots, if, you, if you're the videographer as well as the editor, is to pull focus. Um, so go from out of focus into focus, get your shot, then go out of focus, right? Now you need to do that again, right? So you keep shooting normal and then you go from out of and then you go out of focus, into focus, and then back again. So you're giving yourself these shots that can go in and out nice and smooth. So it's not the end of the world, but it certainly gives you a creative choice. Uh, and it's a great way to, to shoot. Boom. So we're going to mark that. Very important. And it's also a, where I've cut is a moment where he's actually doing a bit of action. Actually, I haven't cut, I've marked. Um, but if we go back to the previous marker, we can mark that now, because if I'm especially impressed, um, I go start of um, focus out, uh, or focus in, and then white, and we're done there. So I'm telling myself that I'm focusing into the shot. Now, believe it or not, this is actually the way to mark your shots in real time. Okay. There's no quick way of just scrubbing through like crazy. Remember, like I said, it's, it's not, you're not here 
in a race. This is not some, you know, touch type fanatic going on here, just smashing through. Um, take your time. You know, watch the footage. Some of the great editors would watch and rewatch, watch and rewatch, and people would question why they would win, you know, awards for their for their editing. Why did people come to them in the first place to do the editing? It was because they were incredible. They would sit and watch something and really take the time to find the exact moment they want to go in. And the way they would do it is watch it in real time. They would rarely ever scrub through quickly. The only time they scrub through is because they're getting to something they obviously want to get to. But to mark the footage and to decide where's everything, it, you can see I'm in here. This is now going to be marked as red because I'm in the shot. So let's do that. Okay, classic example of what you wouldn't pick up if, uh, if you weren't watching real time. I'm in the shot, right? And I've marked it red. Bang. Reflection, yeah? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and while I was chatting, I forgot to do something. Now, what another thing I could do is another moment is expression. Right? Saturday, I face the southern stand. So I'll go mark and go southern stand, <clears throat> right? And then go great expression. And in here, I've now got myself a little note, great expression. So believe it or not, marking Eclipse, I could watch this again now and keep adding more markers as I, as I think through. And believe it or not, that's editing. Editing is actually watching the footage marking it and deciding what's in, what's out, what's good, what's bad, okay? Once you've done that, believe it or not, the cut is really easy because you quite literally know exactly what you're in for. The work of an editor, in my opinion, is watching the footage and deciding um, all parts of the song where something belongs, okay? And, and you most certainly will be pretty much done when you actually go to cut. So believe it or not, a lot of good video editors will talk about um, editing is really watching the footage and picking your locations. Once you've done that, the actual cutting is like that. It's a, it's a snap. What you don't want to do is find a shot, go, oh, that looks really good, and then drop it into the timeline, and then you haven't watched anything. So you're now assembling a video or a movie or whatever without having watched any of the other footage. Crazy, right? Really, seriously, not the way to go. So this is why we do what we're doing now. Can you see how good a 50 mil lens is on a Canon 5D? And a Canon 5D these days, you can buy, especially the 5D Mac II, for about $800. The lens is $150. And quite frankly, with the Magic Lantern added to it, um, you can pretty much get uh, and, a, and a really good compact flash card. I'd recommend getting a 128 gig compact flash on BNH. h um, Get a fast one. Get a good one. Don't get crappy ones. So get maybe SanDisk is probably the best. Um, so get SanDisk 128 gig, super fast. You want it as quick as possible. And see if you can't get away with it. I'll do the test, but see if we... What we'll do on our next shoot is record straight to a um, compact flash card with raw file. This was actually H.264. Um, it's not too bad, don't get me wrong, but <clears throat> realistically, if you shoot raw um, and use the profile that I'll use on the Hurlbut website, there's a Canon 5D profile that he's selling. I'll try it. I'll see if it works. We'll test it out and see how it looks. And if it looks amazing, then there's, there's an incredible um, camera that you can use to shoot music videos that will probably cost you around $1,500 um, and perfectly usable, perfectly usable um, footage. Imagine that, a 50, uh, a 50 mil lens for $150 and it, and it gives you incredible footage. Uh, Magic Lantern is obviously free. Um, 
just be careful with it, of course, but it's free to, to download, it's free to install on your compact flash card. I'm just looking for the point where I come in, see, you can see me, whoa, little Johnny's in the background there, so I shouldn't be. I get out of the shop, but I'll probably come back in again, doing something in the bar. Okay, we're going to just wait until I'm out, and I'm hoping I'm not hovering around there for too long. Okay, so now what we have, now what's interesting here, <clears throat> we're going to wait for me to leave. So I'm gone, and now we mark here, and what we're going to hopefully notice is, yeah, see how there's no need to move quickly? Uh, I'm in the shot. I'm sorry, but that's not usable. I have to mark that. Okay, so what I'll do, it's a real shame, and wow, you know, being in reflections, I've done this before, where I've accidentally been a shadow as well in the shot. And in this case, I'm a reflection. This is the basic stuff, guys. This is the stuff where, you know, use your brains and, and be aware of where you're coming in. Especially when someone's singing like this and you're sitting there hovering around playing with a lens cap or something stupid. It is irritating that I've done that, especially on such an important scene. I'll mark it, but I'm, I, I don't think we're going to use it, unfortunately, because he's done such a good job. Yeah. So what I could be doing now is saying something like this. So I go, it's a mystery, right? So what we're looking for is the line. So now I can mark things as a line. And of course I could change the color, which I think is a good idea. So eventually what I'll do is I'll watch this again. And these little colors here is technically cyan, but whatever. Um, we can start putting these in where we know where the song parts are. Okay, and he's scratching his head, so that's out. So to do that, we just literally go like this, boom, M, M, and scratching head. So that's out. And done. So we know that that's out. I could also, also mark moments where I'm in the shot, definitely. So, you know, unfortunately, I sort of, crop up here like a fool this is stuff that i'd be spewing if it was anyone but me and of course i am spewing that it is me because that's pretty dumb um but there you go so we've marked the clip the next thing that we'll do i'll pause it here because i think you guys get what's going on um this was a bit of a discussion of how to shoot what the Manfrotto's capable of, what kind of shots we're doing, um, that type of thing. And once again, when I did the prelude, what I would have been better off doing is labeling things properly. So on the next video that I do, you'll actually see that. You'll see that this clip would have been labeled close up of guitar. Not even actually, um, guitar on couch literally what it is so guitar on couch so i know that just by reading that title uh it's guitar on couch now do you go in and start renaming you know deciding oh you know what it's not named the way i want oh let me just just change that the answer is no um a lot of guys will avoid it for an obvious reason you can get into a trouble into trouble very very quickly so if i start renaming these especially after opening a um a, a file and doing everything 
it's not a good idea and generally it's not a good idea because it can cause problems. So the only time to rename files is with Adobe Prelude. So you, um, I would normally have now gone, well, that's what we're up to. So if you double click this, that was the clip. So instead of this being called whatever it is, which is, you know, um, let's just look at it. <clears throat> so right now it's titled. Let's have a look. So right now it's titled 7 Canon 5D Steve Mystery in the Bar. But that's what all of them are except for the first number. So what we would have been better off doing is going, when this was ingested, it would have been better off as you know, Canon, fair enough. But there's no point naming a, a camera. I mean, maybe I could have just gone Canon 5D. Obviously, it's Steve, unless there's anyone else in the music clip. So there's no point putting Steve in there. There's no point putting mystery in there. But what you would have done is gone guitar on couch, right? So then I would just, re without even knowing anything other than just reading it. So this one might be Steve close up, right? Um, Steve close up, Steve close up, right? Then over here, we might have something like Steve walking in, right? And so we get, you know, five of those. So we know that these are all the takes of him walking in and everything else. So that's a better way to do things going forward. Um, you know, we sort of look at this and we just decide, have we got anything interesting here? You know what? This is probably not the best clip. Maybe you use that. Probably not, to be honest. So let's just have a look. This is a good time to scrub because I suspect that we're actually not getting anything useful. So this is, this is a classic example of, um, you know, scrubbing. There's nothing wrong with scrubbing this because we've got the camera pointing at the floor. And this is a classic example of wasting time. Um, one, recording, and then going, nah, nah, I'm not doing anything, and then just moving around, and then, you know, even moving a glass, you know, taking, filming myself removing a glass from the bar, you know. So this is stuff that tells you you shouldn't be doing it. Having said that, that I've self-scolded myself. Let's just watch it for in real time about there. There's something actually quite nice. Um, not me moving the hands, but from here to there, <clears throat> we've got this kind of unusual feel. Okay, and we certainly won't be using that. So we're going to go back, back, back. Let's just get it to about there. And we might use it. There's something about it. It's something... This actually could potentially be the start of the film clip for me because it's it's showing the emptiness of it. I actually would have preferred... I'll tell you how we could have improved this shot. Just hold the damn camera steady. Um, that would have been perfect. If we had just held the camera steady, we would have been fine. And I mean, I'm just going to look and see if we didn't get anything a bit better out here. Classic example of just hold, just literally with a Manfrotto like that, ideally we're going to have a shoulder um, stabilizer, which I've now realized why you have the shoulder um, sort of pad, have that clamped to with rails on the, um, the Manfrotto rails, then hold the steering wheel. <coughs> and the reason you do it is it stops the tilting of that. So when you have it on your shoulder, the only thing that you can only now move is actually you. You can only sway, but you won't find yourself tilting that way or, or that way. You'll find yourself doing the sway and just hold really, really steady. Um, we may or may not use that. Let's see if we did a better job of it here. Clearly, you can see, <clears throat> you know, at this point we could mark it. So, you know, to me, that doesn't work. So I'll just mark that red. 
a little bit too stagey. Let's see if we get a better job of it here. It's not too bad. So we might want let's go a little bit earlier. Space bar mark. Boom, so he steps out of the frame. And that's out. Uh, let's have a look at the next one. Now the problem is, obviously the actor's looking at us to say, hey, is that okay? And of course, that's not what we want at all, but let's have a look. Okay, so he's obviously waiting, so we can't use that because he's gone, oh, hang on a minute, do I come in? So there's a bit of a problem there. So we might go mark it there. Okay, let's look at the next one. Okay. About there. The best thing you could tell an actor like this, or in this case, Steve, go slower. Move slower. That's it. That's what you're generally going to tell an actor is just to move a little bit slower, unless it's a fight scene, and then tell them, don't look at the camera. Okay. Now, he's obviously got his leg crossed the wrong way. So for continuity purposes, his leg's actually the wrong way. But we probably wouldn't even use him actually sitting down literally anyway. And let's just see if this is any good. So I might not bother with that. Let's have a look at the next one. Let's go control S for save. So we'll mark. About here. Where we think it's kind of usable. What I'm looking for is a certain style of movement in the Manfrotto, not too kind of jarring and kind of random. You know, what I think isn't good with the Manfrotto is when you start to see too many sort of up and down and left to right movement, but it's okay when you get to here, we've just got this subtle little movement, whereas here, I'm not sure, it doesn't seem to work. Could be wrong, it might be something okay here, but we start to see that, you start to see, especially on the edge here, see how you're getting that little that, that type of thing isn't what you want. You don't want to see too much happening on the edge of the frame. It, doesn't, it seems to be bouncing, which 
you don't want. So let's have a look at the next one. Don't get me wrong. I mean, this bouncing style is fine if it's an action movie. If it's a, you know, so it's not a hard and fast rule here. Obviously, in our case, we don't want too much, you know, of that jarring action. We we want to smooth it out as much as possible, but still have that subtle feel to it. So it's a shame you didn't hold that. So what I've always found, another thing about acting and performing, hold the gaze. So hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Don't do that, unfortunately. So you know you don't want an actor that suddenly goes, oh, is my face right? Is my makeup okay? Um, you know, looked at, you know, looked at us, right? You don't want that clearly. So because that pulls everyone out once people know, you know, obviously him talking to us is no good either. That's no good. So we can see that, you know, he looked at us, but that's the point I'm making is that it would, this would have been much better if he had held it. He holds it till about there. And then we lose it. And then we've got this moment where I think it's nice. So we've got that. So once again, like I said, with actors, you don't want someone that sort of does something, half does it, and then stops in the middle and goes, oh, am I on my mark? Or, you know, they start acting and then halfway through, oh, um, am I in the shot? You know, that's horrifying. And, and, and that's hugely, hugely problematic. In the same way, a camera guy decides to do a pan and then halfway through decides, you know what? I don't think I started it properly. So he goes back and now he's filming himself quickly flick back when he starts that pan again and then decides, you know what stuff it actually think it'd be nice if I do this. And then, so you just get this camera half doing everything for 10 minutes and it's an editor's nightmare, right? So sometimes as an editor, if you're in early on the piece and you're talking to videographers, sometimes it's not a problem I think if you kind of give them a heads up of what to be careful of um, in terms of shots and whatnot. So if I think the whole thing's about the same, okay, which it's not. So we'll get to about here. He stops. So let's go early, 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 early. So we go to about there. Boom, let's mark that. Go home. Mark that, that's fine. So the next one, see how much we got left. Really nice. And what I'm liking about this shot I think it was getting a bit darker at this time of the day. Um, it was starting to get late. But what we've got is really nice darks around the outside of the guitar, which I love. This is really nice. Really smooth, really subtle, nothing crazy. As you can see, you don't need a lot. Brilliant. So this is where the song starts. Okay. Okay. So we're going to go mark, mark, and go to double M, of course. Okay. Lyric. Start. Escape. Please stop doing that. Start of the song. And we're going to mark it white because that's a potential start to the song. Control S in case we haven't done anything for a while.
Okay, so then, right. Now I've marked white to suggest I think this should be in the clip. We're gonna go double M. We're gonna mark it this color, sunflowers lyric. Or sunflowers verse. Okay, that's enough for me to know that this could potentially be used. Now I'm hoping, as an editor, that we don't go doing anything stupid with the camera move, right? And by stupid, I mean move too quick, move too back, jump around, swat a fly, do something that, quite frankly, is unnecessary. Um, even if the videographer, or in this case, Jamie, realizes that he's out of focus, for example, why would he want to just suddenly zoom in or suddenly push forward too quickly? You do that slowly. You move in subtly because we can use the shot. And so we've learned that from previous shoots. Stop doing those idiotic fast moves. They're unnecessary, right? There's nothing wrong with the occasional, you know, move that's a little bit quicker, but pull it off. Don't go doing something too fast that it's totally unusable. This is brilliant. This is excellent. Uh, we might just mark it a little bit earlier here. Go bang, mark, mark, and go out of focus. Or we might call it creative focus. In the case of a music video, you get away with it, so it's not a problem. M, M, and go love close-ups. Done. And now you can obviously see that our exposure's down. Something tells me I should have opened up the aperture or increased the ISO. Probably not the ISO, that's a bit dangerous, but certainly in this case, you don't change the subtle speed, you don't change the ISO if you can avoid it. So the aperture was obviously wide open anyway. So the only other thing left is, well, you can't do shutter, you can't do aperture, and you can't do, um, what else could we have done? I guess it would have been the ISO, could have doubled the ISO to allow more light in. It's the safest thing to do. So we'll eventually keep marking and like I said, watching it in real time. And this is one of the reasons why I think on a professional shoot or certainly people that are experienced will stop recording. They'll stop recording. They'll call it. They'll say pause recording, stop recording or cut. And that means stop the recording and stop the recording on the camera. Stop the recording if you were doing sound, sound recording as well. That's important. You know, um, those sorts of moments are really important. Now, this is where we started to get the fretboard um, and going for the fretboard more. Bang, bang. I think we're going to go with that just to be white. So, because we might use that. Once again, in the cameraman's mind, he goes, oh, let's get to the fretboard. But while you get to it, move in smooth, right? So that's what I would say there, close, close, and then go close up. I, I actually forget what that is, the um, drawing a blank on the, the name of this, uh, but that's okay. The tuning, the tuning of the tuners.
Okay. Mark, mark, and go out of focus. So that's that. Let's go to the next one, Control S. So I think it's a little bit too quick, the movement. Might be good. Now, this is interesting. We've got a lot more close up here, which is fantastic. And this is where, once again, the name of this video clip, instead of it being number 19 underscore Canon underscore blah, 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 you would be better off going 19 underscore Canon underscore extreme close up of guitar. Having said that, we're marking it now. This is great cutaway. Boom, I'm assuming that's the end of that. So we'll jump to the previous, go M, excellent, extreme, close up. And once again, in my case, it's white. So I'll mark it as white to suggest it's possibly gonna go in. Okay, we got to the end of that, let's go here. Would've been good if we had a pulled focus in there. That's okay, we're just gonna come back down again. Brilliant, right? So, okay, let's just start with the pan down. So we go M, M, and P, A, N, down. Enter, and then let's see what we've got on the end of this. All good. Okay, so we can go bang, M, M, and then begin to focus out. Okay. And the shots are getting shorter. Mark it. going to see what we did here yeah so at this point in time we wanted this footage to be more of the background and more of this and this is because we might overlay the memories now we on purpose wanted this overexposure so we did that on purpose that's obviously blown out and we could fit some of the the, the memory video in here so the way we would do that is we'd mask this out and do a blended mask out. Now, rather than do a really complex rotoscope, what we'd want to be doing is getting that on a tripod and seeing if we can't just see if the memories aren't there. So realistically, this would have been better if we were blown out, overexposed in here and his memories... So then, well, I don't even think we need to do it, to be honest. I think what we're going to do is have the memory videos in here, and then they're just masked out, and then we, we kind of still see this overblown over the top of it. We'll work it out, but that's the idea behind this. Having said that, let's look at the next round. Trying to work out what I was doing in here. Let me have a look. Now, 
Now, what we're going to do with this... This is not a problem. Technically speaking, I would have um, probably done this on my Panasonic camera, which has got a built-in hybrid stabilization. The GH4, the Panasonic DVX200 also has it. And you use the, the stabilization that's built into the camera. Plus, the cool thing about the Panasonic DVX is it's also got a stabilization in the lens. So the lens is stabilized. And also the actual sensor has stabilization built into it and then throw that onto a Manfrotto with your little shoulder support. And you've got yourself some pretty cool looking um, shots in here and it's got a really nice feel to it. So having said that, I would absolutely tell you right now that when you're involved in shoots like that, you want to record a color card in each of those cameras at the start of each take or close to it. That way your color matching doesn't become a nightmare. You wanna make certain that you plug your five Canon 5D into the Atomos to double check that it's got pure white balance, either with a gray card, which I think 5Ds work better with a gray card, but just make sure that, that gray card is sitting um, in the waveform uh, where it needs to and in the vector scope. I'd probably have to show you how to do that. It's probably one of the future videos we'll have to do, but put simply, you'd want to be color balancing off of the, um, I use the x right color checker card <clears throat> and it's brilliant. So the x right range, I think they also do one for video called Passport, bit pricey though. Um, and also they do the classic color checker um, x right card, which essentially you just literally film it in front and as the day changes, it's a good idea to keep filming it. So we were here for about two hours. I would, I would assume that every hour, you know, your shots um, have the, the, the card in front. If you want to be really pedantic, you film the card in front of each shot. But realistically, once you've got a color match or a color match between the cameras, you copy and paste your color corrections across each, which we'll show you. Um, but because we only stuck with the Canon, we don't need to worry about it. But if it was a multi-camera shoot, I've certainly learnt that you want to be um, uh, filming and using your colour cards. Otherwise, that can become a bit of fun later uh, in terms of trying to get it to work. Let's have a look at these last couple of shots when we're done with the Canon camera. So this could be cutaway overlay. So in other words, what we have is the bar in the background sitting at maybe 10 15% or whatever it is, and then the overlaid stuff on top. We'll see how we go with that. Um, and we'll sort of get a feel for what we're doing. But this is fine. We get it. And of course, like I said with Prelude, we would have renamed that Shot to the Bar. This is more of a test, to be honest, to see how the Manfrotto handles the um, footage. Okay, so we've marked everything. Now you get, you know, the first hour or two is actually spent marking the clips and making certain that everything's right. We may use this just as a little bit of a fun thing to cut to. Notice, however, that it's a little bit dark in here. So um, what I could have done is obviously had the ISO set to 320 or 640. So the numbers um, on the ISO for the Canon 5D is 160, 320 or 640 or 1250. In this case, it probably would have been better at 640. I've now since bought a light meter so that uh, definitely helps um, with the um, you know checking so literally a light meter I would have just gone click and gone oh wow we're, we're three stops under now what's going on we wouldn't have made that mistake so I, I now use a light meter apparently light meters aren't the way to go listen to me very carefully yeah false color is wonderful um, and as it gets better but a light meter teaches you to understand light and you don't want to understand light when you're staring at a false color meter. You want to understand light when you're in the everyday world and you just want to walk into a scene and, and pre-test the lighting conditions. You start to understand light with a light meter. So light meters, I don't believe, are going anywhere. I love the idea of being able to walk into a fluorescent room and go, okay, what's the color temperature of these things? And you find out that it's, I don't know, what a fluorescent sitting at, 5,000? 
right? Or whatever it is. If their daylight balanced, they'll be 5,000. They might be sitting at 6,000, 7,000. But isn't it great to be able to just walk into a room and, and color temperature it and, and know that. And that's what, this, that's what the light meter's for. In this case, we would have got the exposure right. It's a little bit underexposed, not a big deal. But you'd far, especially in low light environments, you do realize that it's not a good idea to push this up, right? Because you know you're going to get noise in that scene. So you know you're going to get noise. Now you're going to have to use denoiser on it and all this other stuff. Not that you wouldn't use it, you would, but you get the point. If I had to use the light meter in this situation, I would have worked out that it was probably sitting at f2.8 and telling me I'm under, or it would have said f1.4, and I would have said, well, hang on a minute, I'm sitting at f2.2, would have opened it to 1.8, and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that's that for now. This is part one. Um, I'll do part two, which is the cut. Um, and we'll just cut it up and what I call cutting it by the feeling of cutting. Where do we feel the cuts are? And obviously we'll have the music playing a little bit more. Um, that'll be stage two. Stage three, part three will be more than likely the color correction. And then part four will be us superimposing the memories and then getting that over the top and trying to get that to work. All right, guys, we'll catch you on the next one.